Welcome to the Wide World of Esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, our topic is MAP Esports Network. With me is Jacob Miles III, the CEO of MAP Esports Network. Welcome, Jacob. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Okay, so tell us about your company. Uh, MAP Esports Network is, is really focused on uh, uh, helping to bridge digi the digital divide throughout America. We are a play and learn company uh, with community touch points uh, that include mentor-based gaming centers, uh, includes media, uh, magazines, podcasts, social media, and an esports league, which is our Power Players League, uh, that uh, support uh, esports fans, kids, and families with STEM and STEAM-based uh, uh, initiatives, uh, again, to help uh, prepare uh, mainstream and disadvantaged children uh, for uh, the uh, most in-demand jobs uh, and the jobs of the future. Terrific, all right, let's show the video. Want to connect with video gamers and esports fans? MAP Esports Network is the first full service esports network offering podcasts, magazines, gaming centers, and streaming content. Plus, we have a new esports league that brings the positive benefits of esports to all communities. That's right, the future of esports is here. It's right now. The future is MAP Esports Network. If it's about esports, it matters to us. Visit us at mapesports.net. So Jacob, it's so exciting. Now, you know, you said something about that I thought was interesting. You said magazine, okay? Because when I think about magazines, I think about there are some esports magazines. Tell us about what you're doing in that area. Uh, uh, we have uh, uh, three different magazines uh, and our magazines are focused on uh, the, the one in particular are, are tied in with our gaming center. Uh, and they're focused on celebrating uh, those grassroots kids uh, who participate in, in, in esports. But we will celebrate them uh, throughout uh, our magazines. We'll celebrate them on our podcast network. Um, and we, we celebrate them in, in as many ways as we can because they are the future and, and that's our focus. So who's your target market for uh, MAP Esports Network? Well, you know, esports, as you know, is um, uh, is relatively new and not well understood uh, uh, today. And so, as a result, uh, uh, our target market uh, to begin with is uh, the parents and the adults to help them understand esports. The kids, a lot of the kids, they know esports, you know, but it's the it's the uh, adults that need, uh, need some education on esports. Or as one uh, uh, gentleman uh, from the Texas Workforce Commission that we're working with uh, said, Jacob, I, I understand robotics and engineering and media, but I'm, I'm gonna have to go to church on this esports thing. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so he needed a little preaching to, to understand it. And so our, our audience uh, is the family and the kids, as well as the parents. And obviously we have various different messages uh, for each. Sure, and a lot of times you just have to tell someone, Google it, because they don't really get it, right? Right, exactly, exactly. Uh, they, they don't get it, and, and a lot of times you gotta tell them in, uh, uh, in words and comparables that they, that they understand. Uh, because at different uh, cultures, different uh, levels of economic scale, um, you, you can't speak to everybody the same way. Sure. Well, you know, I, I started um, this show, The Wide World of Esports, um, in the summer of 2020. And uh -huh. you know, during a pandemic, it's kind of interesting to start something. And I understand that you're a pandemic business as well. Tell us about how you started and why. Well, when we initially started, we were going to start with events. Uh, and uh, we immediately had to shift um, uh, because uh, uh, events went away with COVID. 
Um, I was coming back uh, from a uh, toy fair and we had plans to do an event around esports and video gaming. Uh, and we were uh, partnering with the esports stadium Arlington on that particular event uh, and had to pull the plug on it uh, because everything got shut down. So then we uh, uh, switched our focus to digital. Uh, and with that, we launched our uh, podcast network and YouTube channels and so forth. And how do you think that um, the pandemic impacted you? I mean, was there anything positive or was it all kind of a negative business situation? Well, uh, for us, it was very positive. Uh, it was positive because uh, everything in esports went online. Uh, and when you look at the, the, the video game industry, as I, I tell folks, you know, um, uh, esports is a subsegment of the video game industry. Uh, and the video game industry uh, was already moving online. Uh, they were moving to the cloud. Um, and so uh, this just accelerated things uh, as far as the video game in industry is concerned. Uh, and so it was very positive for us. We just kind of slid right in there uh, with the evolution of the industry. So tell us about your podcast. Uh, we have uh, eSports, uh, MAP eSports Podcast Network uh, is, uh, we started out uh, with a podcast that focused on helping people understand eSports. Uh, and so we have, uh, I believe eight shows uh, on the network now. We've got, oh, I think four in development. Uh, and uh, our, the shows are around uh, uh, marketing. Uh, that one's uh, uh, with uh, Rebecca Longawa. Uh, and we have uh, uh, John Davidson, who uh, is uh, obviously known in the industry. Uh, we also host the podcast show for the uh, Esports Trade Association. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Mark, uh, who does a master class in esports tied to HBCUs. Uh, and then we have All In with esports with NBC journalists, um, Lewis Johnson, who just arrived back in Tokyo for the Paralympics. He also did the, uh, the Olympics uh, as well. And uh, and he marries esports and sports and uh, Olympics, and he also does the NBA and uh, NFL and and so forth as well. Um, and so we have a variety of shows, in this edition of shows focused on helping people understand esports and all the excitement that's taking place in our industry. Now our next uh, crop of shows will be all kids focused shows. Sure, and will you Hosted have- Hosted by kids. Pardon me? Hosted by kids. Oh, that was my next question because mm -hmm. that, that's exciting. Um, yeah, we're very excited. We've got uh, two in production right now and uh, oh, they're hilarious. Oh, I, I think that'll be fun and that will actually gain a lot of viewers. So mm -hmm. you did mention um, John Davidson of Esports Trade Association. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, so are you a member? Absolutely, I'm a member, um, a supporter, sponsor, absolutely. No question, we'll be there uh, in uh, September uh, for their first uh, in-person uh, event. And very excited about that. We are the official uh, uh, podcast network for the event. Terrific, and so what, what value do you find um, that Esports Trade Association gives you? Well, you know, uh, trade associations are critical for uh, industry's growth. Uh, and uh, it, it's critical because uh, they promote the industry. Uh, they also bring together the industry for networking uh, opportunities. They bring together the, inter the industry for education uh, opportunities. And so, uh, if you uh, want to uh, connect with folks efficiently, uh, then the trade associations usually enable you to do that. 
uh, as opposed to running around uh, trying to see and get in touch with uh, 30 different people. Uh, you can go to a trade association event and you can touch 30 different people in a couple of days, you know, uh, whereas that would be impossible uh, um, in a month or sometimes even a year to catch up with folks um, uh, without the trade association event. Yeah, I can, I completely agree with that. A lot of my guests are from the Esports Trade Association and that's how we met as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I understand you have a very interesting background. Tell us about that. Well, it, you know, I um, began uh, as an at-risk kid in the housing projects of Cincinnati and uh, through mentors, uh, uh, a church and family members were able to rise above my circumstances and become an engineer. Uh, and um, uh, starting out with GE doing aircraft engines uh, and then to Procter & Gamble doing tooling, uh, which was my first intro introduction to consumer products, uh, and then into toys. Uh, and that was with Kenner Toys uh, there in Cincinnati. And uh, once I landed in the toy business, I said, this is it, I found my home. And I've been in the toy and gaming business ever since, uh, and have had the chance to work on some of the most uh, uh, popular uh, brands in pop culture. Uh, worked with George Lucas on Star Wars and uh, worked uh, on, oh, just about uh, every major pop culture item that, that's out there over the years. Uh, but worked with Kenner and then General Mills Toy and Entertainment Group. Uh, and Tonka Corporation. And my last job in the industry was, uh, oh, Sega, can't forget Sega, worked for Sega. I uh, was on a team that introduced Sega game systems in America. Uh, and um, then uh, worked for Hasbro uh, for, as the uh, uh, vice president for Hasbro was the last uh, job I held and was there when we uh, did the uh, Magic the Gathering and uh, deal and and uh, and so forth. Um, and the toy industry is is the entertainment industry. And when you look at toys, you look at video games, you know, we were doing video games in the toy industry uh, back in the 70s. You know, Parker Brothers, which was part of uh, the Kenner Parker and General Mills group, was doing video games. Uh, uh, Coleco was doing ColecoVision and it, Mattel was doing in television. You know, of course, uh, all of that evolved into uh, PlayStations and, and Xboxes and Nintendos and, and Sega game systems uh, and so forth. And so they're all part of the entertainment industry. And I see them as reflections of life. Toys are reflections of life. Video games are reflections of life. Uh, we exaggerate life or we downplay different components, but at the end of the day, they're reflections of life. You know, it's kind of interesting because in the toy industry, it seems like, you know, back way back when toys were objects and then it has evolved to uh, interacting with a screen and, uh, you know, more interaction. Uh, what are your thoughts about how that has changed? And it seems like toys, like games have been, it's brought and the audience, it used to be that toys were more for adults, I mean, for children. And then now with video games, it extends the time that you would play. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, no question. I mean, uh, I have a lot of uh, uh, the toys I've worked on over the years. Uh, action figures, for instance, Star Wars action figures, you know, um, um, all kinds of uh, stuff like that, electronic held held games that we used to do. Uh, but when I go to the store uh, and go, I still walk the toy aisles and the video and 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 video game uh, aisles at toy at toy stores. But when I go to the store uh, and walk down the toy action figure line, it's adults. It's more adults than it is kids because they're collectibles. You know, they've become they've turned into collectibles, and Sotheby's and Christie's are auctioning off these action figures. So you've got 40 year olds buying action figures. So uh, and video games 
are they uh, have not only brought an older generation as they've grown up with video games, uh, it also has taken that same generation and brought them into collectibles and uh, the physical side of the games. Because obviously Star Wars is a video game. Fortnite is a video game. You walk in the toy aisle, there's Fortnite toys, there's Star Wars toys, there's NFL toys, there's NBA toys, you know, action figures, you know, and so uh, uh, they go hand in hand. And I'll see, think you'll see in esports more and more interaction between physical toys as uh, uh, inside of inside of the esports games, inside of the video games. Uh, there'll be different ways you'll be able to interact with the two. Uh, and there's some of those things in development now uh, that uh, is going to be very, very exciting. That's that's super interesting. So let me ask you a big question. So how can esports make the world better, Jacob? Well, I think the way that esports can make the world better is that uh, for us not to fall into uh, what I call the pro trap. Uh, and the pro trap is uh, uh, driving and, and trying to and communicating to these kids through our action that uh, the way to success, uh, the only way to success in esports is to be a pro. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with you see it in, in, in basketball and football, a uh, kid playing basketball, uh, I'm going to be LeBron James. Well, no, you're not. <laughs> you're not going to be LeBron James, you know, uh, and and you're probably not going to be a pro esports player making tons of money either. Uh, but we have to make sure they understand the careers and opportunities behind esports, you know, because those are some great jobs that generate uh, uh, very, very positive lifestyles. Uh, and, and livable wages, you know, as graphic artists, as uh, uh, writing computer code, uh, even announcers, you know, and podcast hosts, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, those are the things that we have to do. We have to communicate uh, what's behind esports as well as esports the game. Sure. And I'm actually an esports attorney and mediator. Yeah. And <laughs> yep. So that's a great example of that. And I've had many people on the show that are, you know, I've had Gamer Doc, who is a medical doctor treating esports people. I've had Psych Sensei, who is a psychologist in this space. And, you know, it's a, there's a huge um, industry of marketing um, and people involved in um, branding, advertising. Um, no, absolutely. Well, and, you know, um, so it's definitely huge. And, has a huge ecosystem. So what do you think the future of eSports uh, is like? So exciting. It is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, right now uh, we think of eSports as uh, a, a controller, you know, a mouse, you know, and, and, and looking at a video screen. Uh, Esports is going to become more physical. Uh, it's going to become uh, an example would be uh, an esports dodgeball game. You know that is uh, is 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 done uh, with an uh, a ball, an imaginary ball, uh, but the computer it can analyze the trajectory and you throw the imaginary ball and the person got to move out of the way the computer's calculating whether they move fast enough and so forth whether they get hit yeah. and then it's all on the screen you know I, you know those kinds of things are going to be uh, the future everything that you see in real life is going to be in the esports game we're seeing that with concerts inside of an esports game Inside of Fortnite, there's a concert. You know, there's going to be uh, dating inside of esports game. You know, I mean, just anything that happened in real life, we're going to see it inside of esports game. Do you think that with the more these more active type games and 
uh, more virtual reality that the esports athletes will actually have to be more physical in um, doing their work because I, you know, now they're mostly sitting down and mm -hmm. using, you know, uh, their eyes and their hands. But do you think they'll have to be standing up and moving? Yes, uh, no question. And I think that'll be a different uh, class or division, you know, of esports. So I think esports uh, will will broaden as it grows. Uh, as we know, every uh, video game is not an esport, but every esport is a video game. You know, so uh, uh, what we will see is what is defined as an esport is going to change over time, and it's going to broaden. And you'll have different classes, different divisions, and uh, some will be more physical and some will be sitting in a traditional uh, way that we started. Do you think that esports will find a place in the Olympic Games? Uh, yes, uh, I know that it will. Uh, and uh, it is going to come into, you heard it here, into the Paris Games. Esports yeah. will make its debut in the Paris Games. Uh, our our league, the Power Players League, is patterned after the model that uh, the Olympic uh, has generated, uh, in that we don't have any human simulated killing in our league, and the Olympic uh, esports will not have any human simulated killing uh, in Olympic esports play either. So, uh, but. Uh, definitely uh, going to. We um, had a, a team in Paris uh, earlier this year in the middle of COVID, which was interesting. Uh, but uh, matter of fact, uh, in that video clip was Lewis in Paris talking to some of the folks uh, in an esports cafe um, that uh, we're teaming up with. Sure. Uh, yeah, that's a, a really... Um big interest of mine. I've done a lot of uh, speaking all over the world on uh, Olympic risk management issues. So I'm particularly interested in Paris and how that's going to um, happen. Uh, mm -hmm. But let's move, and we're kind of moving uh, around the world a bit. So let's talk about uh, America versus um, South Korea, uh, China, Europe, uh, and esports. Mm -hmm. um, what do you think is the difference in terms of esports in uh, you know different places in the world and why and do you think esports is as important in america as it is in those other places well we've got some work to do uh, here in the united states um, uh, when you look at esports uh, in in south korea uh, in china uh, and in different parts of europe uh, you know they have, it has become an industry uh, and, uh, and a relatively mature industry. Uh, here in America, we're at the beginning stages. Uh, we're trying to develop it into an industry, you know, and so, uh, you know, you can count our esports stadiums on one hand. Uh, you can't count China's on one hand. You can't count Korea's on one hand. You can't count Europe's on one hand. You know, they 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 are ahead of us. Uh, there are a lot of reasons for that, um, but there is we have the technology, we have the publishers, uh, we have uh, everything to to lead in this area in esports being an industry. Uh, but what we don't have uh, is the infrastructure to support an industry and that infrastructure a lot of that is is media infrastructure so uh for it to become an industry we can't just have pros we have to have the grassroots involved you know uh because that the masses is what makes it a full-blown industry um one of the reasons that we have not excelled the way they have is that when you look at Korea and China, uh, everyone gets the same bandwidth, you know, and it's one, it's one service. Here's 5G for everybody, you know. Uh, here, uh, 
we probably got 10 5Gs. You got Verizon's 5G, AT&T's 5G, Spectrum's 5G. You, I mean, you got, and none of them talk to each other. You know, so you got to have uh, 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 some, uh, something that the one can talk to the other. That hinders esports play. That hinders mobile play, you know, because you, you don't have an equal playing field, you know. Uh, and if one guy's got much better bandwidth than you, then how, how are you going to compete against him and play on a, in mobile esports? You know, so we're way behind in mobile esports. We're catching up in uh, the, uh, 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 I call it desktop esports. Uh, but uh, uh, so we've got some work to do. We, we've got to have more people like you uh, that can celebrate, promote the industry and make sure everyone uh, is, is aware of it. But we have so many corporations, their senior executives do not understand esports. Right. Right. And you and yeah. we can't we can't grow with it with that being the case. Right. And we have a, a problem in Hawaii because we do have. Uh, you know, uh, we do have some latency in terms of servers being on issues, although we've had um, Overwatch League come to Hawaii and uh, compete um, all summer in, in a, a tournament. So that's a positive step forward. But I feel like almost Hawaii, we need to catch up with um, L.A. and New York and Atlanta, but we really need to catch up with um, other areas of the world mm -hmm. like China and Europe and South Korea. So um, do you have any um, thoughts on how we can move in that positive direction? Well, I mean, I, I think the, the biggest thing is um, having organizations like the Esports Trade Association to, to promote and grow uh, the industry. Uh, and then we got to help them grow uh, because uh, they're not there yet, uh, but they need to grow to the point where they can hire lobbyists, you sure. know, because that's what trade associations do. They lobby on behalf of different industries. Right now, there are no lobbyists for esports. So there's no one uh, promoting uh, esports and things that are, are, are business friendly for us. You know, you have the video game industry. But uh, I grew up with a lot of the guys that are running that, you know, you know that run the, uh, that are running video game publishers, uh, and they will tell you in a minute. We're not interested in promoting esports. We're interested in promoting Fortnite. We're interested in promoting Call of Duty. You know, uh, now that's an esports game, but we're not we're not selling esports. We're selling Call of Duty. We're selling Fortnite. You know, uh, for me to sell esports, then I'm helping my competition. Sure, sure. You yeah. know what I mean? I, that, that's not what I'm trying to do. So right now, we don't have we don't have a beacon. We don't have uh, that that entity or that 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 industry that's out there beating the drum. And that's what Map Esports has built itself as is to be here to support and grow uh, the industry by celebrating the players, the companies, you know, uh, and, and helping people understand how big and important this industry can be. So how can people contact you and find out more about your company? Uh, they can contact us at um, uh, sales at mapesports.net, uh, uh, .com, I'm sorry for sales, but uh, they can, uh, uh, Visit our podcast at esportsfpn.com, uh, and they'll see there that uh, uh, the different uh, shows and so forth to get a better understanding about what's going on in esports. Uh, and uh, they can also go to our website at mapesports.net. Well, Jacob, it's been terrific having you as a guest today, and we learned so much. Appreciate it. Oh, I enjoyed it so much, and. Uh, uh, I'm ready to come to Hawaii. Fantastic. Well, we look forward <laughs> to seeing you. So uh, thank you for joining us today. And next week, my guest will be Dexter Carr Jr. to tell us all about Game for Good. See you then.